Hi again, everybody. This time I'm going to talk about some advanced underlay control planes. Specifically, I'm going to talk about desktop flood and uh, which is uh, a part of or was a part of the open fabric control plane and rift. So let's talk about those for just a minute just to give you a sense of those those two different options. Now, these options are, by the way, implemented but largely in experimental code. Very difficult to get your hands on. Now, FR routing does have an open fabric daemon, um, and there is an implementation of Rift you can get your hands on if you know the right person to ask. But these are not something that you can run in production. Well, you could run desktop flood today in production if you were running FR routing for your routing protocol stack. But other than that, there are implementations by vendors uh, in the way or on the way right now as I as I do these sessions. So I want to cover these so you have a sense of what they are. So when you hear about them, you're not totally baffled. Like, what is that? What is going on there? So let's talk about this top flood first. First, this is a version or a modified version of IS to IS. Uh, what actually happened here is there is a type of network called a mobile ad hoc network or a MAN-A that was very common or is very common in military circles and in other circles like military transport and things like this. And in those worlds, they want very highly efficient protocols, but they want link state protocols for the most part. So early back in the 1990s or something like that, a bunch of us got together and worked on some ways to optimize flooding and other operations of link state protocols for these mobile ad hoc networks. Well, the desktop flood work, which I call it that because it's draft white desktop flood in the IETF, is a repetition or a modification of that work in order to make it work in a data center fabric. And one interesting and important thing to note about desktop flood from the very beginning is that the optimizations that are given here, most of the optimizations that are given here, will work in any topology. They're not really restricted to a data center fabric like some of the other options like Rift are. Um, they're just, these are just general optimizations that happen to work very, very well in high ECMP fan out networks. So let's look at desktop flood for a second. There are actually two types of flooding optimization in desktop flood. The first is what I call a forward optimization, and the other is what I call a reverse optimization. They're actually phrased this way in the draft. So if you read the draft, you'll see those two types of terms in there, forward optimization and reverse optimization. So in the forward optimization case, what happens is, is that after you've exchanged your LSDB, you have a tree. You can build a local flooding tree based on the uh, the topology of the network locally close to you as an intermediate system. So let's take this router down here. What it would do is if there's some change, say connected to it is 100 colon colon slash 64, and that falls off the network. What it does is, is it can run SPF using setting all link costs to one. And what this does is it gives you a topology view rather than a shortest path first view of the network. So it's not an optimized tree because I don't really care about optimizing which link or path I take through the network. I'm just looking for an optimal flooding tree in this case. So what I do is I run an SPF with a cost of one. And from that, I know which set of neighbors I'm connected to and who my two hop neighborhood is, as I will call it here, okay? So what I will do is I will select a set of neighbors to flood to that will be able to reach all of my two hop neighbors. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flood to them in a way where they can reflood. And everyone else I'm gonna flood to in a way that they cannot or should not reflood the LSA or the LSP that I'm sending to them. Now here at this first stage, it's not gonna make much difference because I have to flood to all four of these intermediate systems because they have different sets of two hop neighbors, right? So this router or intermediate system has these two neighbors, this one has these two, this one has these two, and this one has these two. So I'm gonna to flood to all four of these in a way that allows them to reflood. Now, when I get to this stage, however, this router is going to say, these two routers have exactly the same neighbor set. So what I'll do is from this router is I will flood to say this intermediate system in a way that allows it to reflood. 
and I'll reflect to this one using a link local packet signaling, which says take this packet in, but don't reflood it. Just accept it in your database and just use it for your local SPF. So that's what I'm going to do. So here, I would flood here in a way that allows it to reflood. I would flood here in a way where it doesn't allow it. Now this router is, or an immediate system is going to do the same thing. It's going to look at its two connected neighbors, and it's going to say, if I flood here, I can reach all of these. If I flood here, I can reach all of these. So I'm going to flood to these two and allow them to reflood. Now, these two will reflood to all four of these. Now what's going to happen, however, when I do this, is when I reflect to this router, this router or intermediate system is going to want to flood back, right, along that path. Now what I do to solve this is I say, I make the observation that if, or if I receive an LSP from someone, a, a neighbor, and that, and I have some other neighbor that is on the shortest path first back to that same destination or the originator of the change, I don't flood back to someone who is on my shortest path tree or a potential shortest path tree back towards the source of the change. So here I would flood up. This router would look at it and go, oh, I, I, you know, you would flood up and say that the flood comes around this direction first or this direction first and makes it back to here if before this flooding comes up to this direction. So what would happen in that case is this, this intermediate system would say, oh, this link is on the shortest path back to the router that had the change. So therefore, I'm not going to flood back that way. So this effectively reduces the flooding forward in reverse through the fabric. Now what happens if I've only selected one? Let's say I select this as my reflutter, and this router or this intermediate system fails after I sent it. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to use the CSNP capability of IS to IS to once I flooded here, this intermediate system will set a timer and will say after about a second, I'll check CSNP with all my adjacencies and make sure my database matches. Well, that allows me this backup system of providing a a redundancy or a resilience in the network. So these types of optimizations um, in real life can reduce convergence time by about 50% or more. So if it takes about 40 seconds to converge a network and you optimize flooding, it can take about 25 seconds or 20 seconds to converge the network. Uh, as far as literal flooding, um, I said before I've seen 40 to 60 copies of an LSP fragment in an actual network where it was just set up to flood all of a level two flooding domain, this type of optimization reduces it to one to four copies of that same LSP. And you can tighten things up with timing and stuff and make it exactly one copy. But when you get down to about the four range, you're not having much of an impact on network convergence any longer. So um, it's fine not to worry about it. So that is distop flood. <clears throat> now, there is another way of doing this, which is to elect a flooding leader. It could be a virtual device, or it could be a real physical device. And this is going to be very akin to using a route reflector in BGP. So what happens is, is when the change happens down here, this device, either inbound or out of band, will send its changed LSP up to this flooding leader, and this flooding leader will then reflood it to everybody else in the network. Now, the flooding leader does not run SPF and calculate the best paths. It just calculates the optimal set of devices to flood to. It can calculate what's called an optimal flooding tree from its centralized location and say, if I flood here, I know he'll reflood to these. And if I flood there, you know, I can actually pick a set of devices to flood to and tell them who to reflood to, to only allow every device in the network to receive one copy of the changed LSP. Uh, there's a draft for this in the IETF. Um, you can look up Tony Lee and you can find his draft. He's working on this. Um, there is also a paper written by Google called Jupiter Rising that describes a system called FirePath. If you look in there, I think it's called FirePath. I hope I have all the right information there. And it uses the same sort of mechanism of a centralized flooding uh, leader to do this. Now let's talk about Rift real fast. Rift 
stands for routing in fat trees. That's what Rift stands for. So it is a specific protocol. It's not really a new protocol. It's an adaptation of ISIS combined with some distance vector properties in order to make it run really well in a fat tree, in a specifically in a, uh, a spine and leaf, high ECMP fan out spine and leaf topology. In Rift, each link floods just like it would in IS to IS, so you get an LSP change. When you reach the fabric layer or the fab layer, what's going to happen is the fab is going to essentially, at this point, act as though it's an L1, L2 domain boundary. And it's going to take the cost of reaching the destination that it learned about through the normal flooding, and it's going to attach that as a locally connected interface or locally connected reachable destination, just like a Type 3 in OSPF, or just like a, a Layer 2 um, LSP, a Level 2 LSP in IS to IS. I always say Layer 2. I've got to break that habit of saying Layer 2. But anyway, you'll see that what it does is, so it actually acts as a distance vector out from the fabric towards the edge of the network. So whenever a spine receives an advertisement that looks like a distance vector advertisement from the fab layer, it will transmit that as a distance vector advertisement out to its remotes. And then these are automatically set up, these top of racks are automatically set up not to reflect because they only send link state type updates up. So when they receive a distance vector protocol or a distance vector update down, they won't reflood that to anybody because that's just something they received um, and they're only sending link state up. So Rift is kind of an interesting concept in this because it kind of optimizes, self-optimizes things um, and reduces a lot of the routing information because these devices really aren't running SPF on much of anything. Um, they're using a default route to go towards the fab and they are advertising their link state information, these fab routers have a full LSDB because they are receiving full link state information from every place else in the network. It's a very neat concept. Now, of course, because you're doing aggregation here, you get into the, the aggregation black hole that I talked about in another session. Uh, but this is something that you can get around in Rift by doing auto deaggregation. That's why Rift has auto deaggregation is to prevent those routing black holes. Now, I'm not going to argue that one of these is better than the other. Uh, if you go down the ISIS modified versus Rift route, I'll say that Rift is more complex protocol. Uh, it has more stuff in it. It's very laid up directly to a fat tree or to a spine and leaf or a clove fabric. That's what it's designed for, whereas Distop Flood really does a lot more optimization. We're running a lot wider variety of networks. Um, so there are just positives and negatives to these things. There's not necessarily a winner or a loser. It just really depends a lot on the scale you're trying to get to. Um, if you're looking at modified ISIS, you'll again be able to reach the 2600 router range and easily reach the 120,000 route range or reachable destination range. It probably in, the, in commercial implementations will be too much higher than that. We're looking at 500,000 routes or something like that, uh, 500,000 reachable destinations. Rift is going to go much higher than this uh, for the complexity trade-off that you're getting. You're getting a higher route count and you're also automatically reducing the table sizes or the fib sizes down in these edge devices, which can be very useful in devices where you don't have um, where you don't have a lot of memory space. So that's it for this session, and I'll come back in the next one and talk about some just some other odds and ends dealing with um, data center fabrics and what you need to look for.